encounter. Today is September 25th, 2018. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And we're honored today to have with us Mr. John Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams is a veteran of World War II and has kindly agreed to come visit with us. Actually, we're visiting with him in his home and tell us about his life and particularly about his military service during World War II. Mr. Williams, we really appreciate you doing this. And it's an honor to be able to sit down and talk with you. With us today is Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center, Maureen Keeler, who is the Project Archivist at the Atlanta History Center, and Connie Craig, who is Mr. Williams' daughter. And we really appreciate you being here today. I have some family here. Mr. Williams, would you give us your full name and your date of birth? John McLarty, that's M-C-L-A-R-T-Y. Williams Sr., born July 10th, 1923. Okay. And please give us your current address. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, we go back where we started. I was born in Jackson, Tennessee. My mother was screening in the front porch when I arrived. Of course, I was born at home, and when I was two years old, we moved to Memphis. I lived there till we was 12. We moved to Atlanta, and I've been there generally since then, except time in the service. Okay. Where did you go to school, and where did you? What neighborhood did you grow up in? And talk, tell us a little bit about in your uh, years. Atlanta. I went to Lenox, first and second grade third, fourth, fifth, and sixth at Normal Training School, which was a wonderful school. It was on the campus of, at that time, West Tennessee State Teachers College. Now, I think it's Memphis State. Anyway, mm -hmm. the students in the university were our teachers. We had each one of us class, you had a teacher who had their master's degree. and. These students that have one in the morning and one in the afternoon that would teach us a class. And we loved them. They were interesting, and we tried our best because our grades were their grades. And we worked hard to get good grades. And it was a real nice school. And then we moved to Atlanta. I went to Joe Brown Junior High, which is now high school, through seventh, eighth, and ninth, and went to Boys High which is now something else, and through high school. Then I went to Emory University, and I got in two quarters before I went in the Navy. Now, Boys High was one of the few public schools in Atlanta, wasn't it? The time? Yes. <clears throat> for the whites, there was Boys High, Tech High, and Girls High for girls. Commercial was co-ed, was downtown, and the blacks had I know two schools, but I'm not sure anything about those. Yeah. It was a different time. Now, this was somewhat during the Depression, wasn't it, or the later years of the Depression? Yes. Uh, Dad worked for a company in 1929, in 19, probably 33, something along 20, 32 or 33, the company went broke, you might say. The president and vice president opened up a store. And Dad was laid off, but he was very fortunate. He got a job with Kroger while he was still on the payroll of the company, so he never lost any time from work. And then he worked for them, of course, until he was transferred to Atlanta, so he went in 1935. You have any memories of the Depression, what you saw? That Very was... much so. You can't imagine what it's like until you're in it. It's sort of in the atmosphere, it's everything. Uh, nobody had anything. You didn't know you were poor, because everybody else was the same way. Yeah. I carried papers 
starting about 36, 37, somewhere along in there. And I know one of my customers, paper was 25 cents a week then, and he stopped me and told me he was laid off, he couldn't afford the paper anymore. And I'd always, if I had an extra, I'd throw him an extra. Yeah. And then one day he came in with all smiles, said, I got me a job, you start the paper back. Yeah. But it was, it was just bad times. And his dad told me, you walk down the street and you'd see somebody that could do you a job better than you can, but he doesn't have the job and you do. It was just a very terrible time. How many brothers and sisters did you have? No brothers, but three sisters, one younger, about two and a half years, one a little over a year older, and one two and a half years older. So what year did you move to Atlanta, approximately? 1935. 1935. And was that because of a job situation with your father? He yes. He was transferred. Uh, Piggly Wiggly at that time was going under bankrupt, and if they did, they were going to take all of their supplies with them. Because it was a bad time. So Kroger sent the men down here and took over Piggly Wiggly to save them and to save the suppliers too. And it worked because they made it. And of course, they're still quite large now. Yeah. Were you happy about that move or just a little bit unhappy? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to realize that adults live their life and you live Jewish. You didn't get into theirs, they didn't get into yours. I know you even thought about it, yes, no. I had no choice. I mean, it wasn't a matter of deciding what I wanted to do. So go from that point up until you went into the military. What, what did you do? I say I carried papers, and I started my first job. I was 12 when we first moved to Atlanta. I worked at, now at that time, Piggly Wiggly was self self-service. In other words, like you go to, uh, to McDonald's and order a hamburger. You came to the counter, you ordered a loaf of bread. I got you a loaf of bread, a can of corn, and I wrapped it up and yeah. charged you for it. It was not self-service. And I worked two weeks when I was 12. I was I made $2 a week and worked 90 hours a week. I'm not sure I was worth the $2, but anyway, <laughs> that was my first job. After that, I sold magazines to customers we have a route. And then I went back in the grocery store and I would work uh, good. I could work from all day Saturday for a dollar and a half, or I could work from 12 on for a dollar. So most of the time I worked from 12 on and just took a dollar, that's all I needed. And you gotta remember that nothing cost anything but you didn't have anything. Yeah. Uh, when we would travel as a teenager, they had to have suit boxes that suits came in. Mm -hmm. They were about two and a half feet long, 18 wide, maybe three or four inches high. Each one of us had one for all of our clothes and everything. So, and the car was a 1931 Chevrolet that mom won in a contest by writing why I like Cremo cigars. Really? <laughs> and to make it more interesting, I found out when I was grown that when mom and dad were getting ready to get married, she told him she would not marry him until he quit smoking cigars. So he quit smoking cigars and smoked cigarettes and then died of young cancer when he was 79. Uh, but uh, still it was a different place. See, nobody had anything. Yeah. But in carrying papers, I finally got a, a route, made about $3 and a half, I had 60 customers on that route. So when you got out of high school, it was around 1941? 40, 40, 42, actually. Because okay. let's go back to Pearl Harbor. I was in the movie Sunday, and the owner of the movie stopped the movie and came up on the stage 
and announced that the Japs had just bombed Pearl Harbor. So this would have been one o'clock probably in the afternoon. So we all went home. I told mom I'd go, go join the army. She says no. I was still in high school. So finish your schooling because tomorrow they'll have young men lined up trying to get into every one of the services. And so I went ahead and finished school, went to Emory for two quarters. And interesting thing, that time it cost $75 a quarter for tuition. And my books cost maybe $15. And Dad told me that if I would pay for the first quarter, then he would pay for any schooling that I wanted as long as I want what school. So I worked in a grocery store, Kroger, at about $16 a week then. And for 60 hours was a normal week. But uh, I was there for the two quarters. And about the end of the second quarter, we were talking about, we all knew we were going in the service, just a question of time. And somebody said the hardest thing to get into was naval aviation. So next day I was down at naval aviation. It was the old Packard dealership where they set up. So what they, all day long, they gave you every kind of a test you can think of, physical, psychological, you name it. And I was taking the eye test right at about five o'clock. And I could get the death perception, but one thing I was off on, and the doc said, oh, wait, come back tomorrow, you're tired. And so I went back the next day, and when I got home that night, there was my questionnaire from the draft board for me to fill out, so I would have been drafted within 30 days if I hadn't been sworn in the next day. So I went back, was passed the physical, and uh, sworn into the Navy. And then at that time, they were behind, they had more people than they had spaces for them. So they set me up. I was supposed to go in in June of 42. Now this was December of 40, no, December of 42. I was going in of June of 43. And because I lived in Atlanta, they put me at the head of the list, so if anybody didn't make it, they would call me. And they did that in March. So I went in the Navy active March. We went to Columbia, South Carolina University there. And our first uniforms were not uniforms, they were old clothes that they probably couldn't have sold anywhere else. And we had, it's quite an experience. I had been away from home because in the scouts and whatnot. So it didn't bother me a bit. But the first night, well, the first day, we went through all of the shots, all of the haircuts, and then out. And to make certain that the shots worked well, they gave us calisthenics for an hour or two. Out there in the hot sun, so we all were blistered all over our head, where they had shaved our heads almost. And that night, guys were crying everywhere. They'd never been away from home before. It was something. But we stayed there for three months. And we had all sorts of ground school, a weather meteorology, we called it, which is interesting because most of the stuff we learned obsolete is not even true. But we were taught that. We also, engines, uh, navigation, a lot of different subjects. And I've been at Emory, we were studying all the time anyway, so it was nothing to me. So I had top grades all the way through. And two weeks before we to, no, was it? No, that, not that. Uh, we left there and caught a train from there to St. Petersburg. We were stationed in a hotel there, the Navy had taken over. We were under 
St. Petersburg Junior College provided the professors and everyone. And we had, uh, we had to learn code, most, not that, most code, which is a mess. But anyway, our teacher worked the stock exchange and could type like 75 words a minute, taking code. I mean, impossible. And he was trying to teach his wife how to read code by words, not by letters. I always thought that would be interesting, but anyway. Uh, the professor I liked taught navigation. As I say, I was good at anything because I'd been in school. So I ended up sort of being his assistant and we teach the boys that we're having a hard time. But we were there and uh, we flew cubs at the city air field. And my instructors were barnstormers from the First World War and through the 20s. Uh, the one that was in the First World War, he learned to fly in Japan and uh, France during the war. And uh, at that time, there was one plane that if it ever got upside down, you tried to ride it up, it'd go into a flat spin, flat skip spin you can't recover from. He's flying. So his plane gets up, he has to land upside down. So he dove out right before it hit and lived through it. <laughs> Good God. But uh, it was some interesting things. And the uh, one that was head of it, uh, was really good. Turning back into Cater shows whether or not you're sliding or whether you're flying smooth or not. The centrifugal force throws a marble back and forth. His marble was like it was glued. He was just perfect for pilot. And he did all sorts of crazy stunts. And he came up with a stunt that flew over a grandstand and a race track and pick up a handkerchief that was on a pole with his teeth. So that sounded, yeah, we laughed and laughed. And his mechanic went and pulled out his book that had newspapers in it. And there was a picture, a newspaper, him upside down, picking up the handkerchief with his teeth as he flew by. <laughs> but he was good. Uh, and did I'm, you get to know him at all? Oh, yeah. And uh, came in. We found out that cubs are more uh, gliders than they are planes. And if you fly over grass, you settle down. If you fly over houses, you raise up. So you could judge your height by what you want to fly over <laughs> if you're coming into land. And one time, we had a run runway over the grass. And I said, I land on the grass. So I flipped over and sat down. When I did, I sat down right beside another plane on the runway. If I had not moved over, I'd have landed right on top of him. And I got chewed out about that, not because I would have gotten killed, but because I was tearing up the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was real interesting. And at that time, I saw Russians for the first time. We were just like college kids cutting up all the time. They were serious. When they marched, they stomped the feet. And uh, they were there to pick up ships that were being built, minesweepers, being built in Tampa, I think. And they were in St. Pete, but they were there. Did you have any opportunity to interact with them? No, uh-uh. Just going by them and seeing them, and they were unhappy with us. I mean, they just, they didn't like us look at you. But anyway, that was in St. Pete. Well, the last two weeks there, they picked 10 students who had the top grades and gave them either a week or two weeks of, you know, leave to go home. I had good grades, so I got two weeks to go home and visit. Then we came back and went to University of Georgia in Athens and that was pre-flight. And that was about the same thing as the flight prep. 
and but just athletics, a lot of them, everything you can think of. Now, I was always good at swimming. And <coughs> first time they did, whenever you hit a new base, got in the swimming pool and swim. As soon as they do that, they would pull me out, make me an instructor, which made it nice. I got out of a lot of stuff. And I taught a lot of my buddies how to swim too, which was nice. But uh, while I was at Athens, there was a swimming pool in the bottom of one of the buildings there. And we were assigned that. And nobody in my platoon knew how to do the backstroke. I knew how, but that was all. Mine was crawl. Anyway, they time us. I swam the 100 yards in a minute and a half and beat everybody else. So they put me up on the board as a racket, held the racket there for one week. The next week, somebody swam it in a minute <laughs> and took over. But at least I held the record at the University of Georgia for one week. That's something to be proud of. Yeah. Then, uh, and same thing at Athens, the last two weeks, those that had top grades got go home for a week or two weeks. And again, I had top grades, so I went home again. And we left there and went to uh, NAS, Memphis, Tennessee. We were flying Stearman's. Is that Naval Air Station? Yes. Okay. And you had two great big sort of round mats that you landed on. You landed on one, you took off on one, and you look at the wind tee to tell you which direction you were to land or to take off. And so we were flying Stearman's in. And I came in, instructed with me. And as I was just landing, a plane came across right in front of me. So I slammed on the brakes and stood on its nose and tore up my plane, but I didn't kill anybody. And it was an instructor that didn't notice the change of the wind tee, and he landed crossways. So it was his fault, not mine. But at least I tore up an airplane, which is one of my planes. <laughs> then uh, in Memphis, oh, interesting. Uh, a bunch of FOFs, which is a fighter, that the Navy used at the beginning of the war before the F-6Fs came along. And these guys came in, the Canadians, and the instructor told us all, I said, watch, look at see how to fly. You learn how to watch other people, watch this. And about that time, a guy came in and landed and ground looped, <laughs> tore his plane up. So we didn't say anything else to the instructor. <laughs> but it was rough, there was a big storm there where the wind was so strong that as you'd come in to land, they would grab your wing and hold you down on the ground. It was blowing that hard because the plane would probably could fly at 45 or 50 miles an hour. So if with the wind, you wouldn't have any forward speed. But anyway, that was NAS. And there for three months, and went to Pensacola, which is where you really get to fly. And flew, we called multi-vibrators, SNVs. Uh, a prop, it had two gears on it. And normally, it's automatic, next plane up is automatic. It changes when you need it. But this one, one, and if you threw it into low gear, it made lots of noise. That's what we call the Volte vibrator. And in night flying, we'd always fly back over the barracks and slap it into low gear because it'd wake up everybody in the place. <laughs> but anyway, that was uh, there. And at Whiting Field, we flew navigation. And that included, uh, under the hood, uh, blind flying, so you can do it. And that's the first time I was actually saw lightning. Came right down beside the plane, hit the ground and smoke came up. It's like somebody took a big spear of light, 
fire and just threw it down. It was beautiful. But another time I was flying under the hood and it was getting rough. And the instructor finally, I told him I was where I was supposed to be, and he said, okay, knock the hood back. I was right in the middle of a thunderstorm that time too. But it was, it was interesting, we learned. Now that was uh, Memphis. Then we left at Memphis, no, in Pensacola. Whiting, and then we went to Buddy Barron. Barron was losing more men and planes than any spot in the world. So you went to where? I didn't catch it. Barron Field. It's oh. right across the Alabama border in uh, Texas. I mean, in Florida Panhandle. Okay. Uh, in fact, the field's still there. I went by there a few years back. But it was, uh, we were flying SNJs, which was a real good plane. It would do anything. It was not a combat plane, but it was, it was built for combat, but just never made it. And it was good flying. Uh, close as I ever came to bailing out, my engine cut out and I was about 2,000 feet and I had some speed so I climbed as high as I could and disconnected everything, getting ready to crawl out when the engine caught back up. So I came back and George Forma joined formation, went on and some wild tales there. One, there was a flight of six planes came in. One of them had trouble and had to land in the pasture. Well, one of his buddies went down to get him and ran into him and tore up those two planes. Two others are flying around and ran into each other and that got two. So the last two took off back to the field and one of them landed with his wheels up. So they lost five planes out of six. That was an expensive day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there was one kid that got a uh, flunk to flights. He got a down on the flight. And he didn't know how to do it. And I happened to be there at the board. So I was showing him. Because I had had the same problems at one time. Anyway, the next day, he and his instructor crashed, killed them both. So that was my close to being to a person that died in, yeah. in the service. But anyway, got through Barron Field and we got commissioned. And the only thing I remember about commission, it was hot, full uniform, and my hat was, I hated hats anyway, I still don't wear one now. but. It was on my head and it hurt. And when they finally, so they could salute the flag, I did knock my hat back, which was the nicest thing that happened. <laughs> so I remember that one. Uh, and after we got commissioned, I went back to Baron Field, a dormitory, a barracks where I was. And my roommate, he had always teased me because I was reading comic books. I told him, it makes you smart. Well, when I got out of there, I had a full average and all the ground school stuff. And came back to visit. He's sitting in the lobby reading comic books. <laughs> <laughs> so he believed me anyway. But then we left there and went to Miami. And that's where you got in torpedo bombers, TBFs. And they were interesting. They were 3,000 horse. They were the largest single engine plane in the world at that time. Because they're bigger than fighters and all. They could hold one torpedo, 1,000 pound bomb, or two 500s, or they could hold maybe four 500s on the wing, or maybe four or five. 100 pounders on the wings, 
all eight rockets. So they had it lined up. Also, we had fifties through the the, uh, the left flew shot. They went through the prop, so they were judged with the props. So according to the tachometer, is how the the gun would fire. So you could turn it all the way down, hold it, pip, pip. <laughs> That's all it would do. But it was fun. And I had a crewman who had a turret right behind me with two fifty caliber machine guns. And then I had a radio operator in back that uh, handled radio and also radar, which was still top secret then. And it was it was good. But uh, we flew, we had practice uh, concrete torpedoes that weighed a thousand pounds. And we used those to learn how to drop them and so forth. And one plane I flew was not a torpedo plane. I don't know why we did it, but it was had a, it was made out of plywood, and frost got on the wings. You could <laughs> had no lift, and take off one morning, and I got off the ground, but just at it, I came to a five foot fence at the end of the field. I finally got over it and built up enough speed to get going, but. That was as close as I came to tearing up that one. But then uh, we we had fun flying out of uh, Miami with the torpedo planes. There was 12 of us, instructor, assistant instructor, squad commander, and the nine of us cadets. And I was always not staying in formation. I had a friend that was always drunk, and another friend who was always doing dumb things. So nobody wanted to fly with us, so they picked the other six, and we flew by ourselves, which made it nice, because we could do what we wanted to. And one time, we were flying out of Miami, and I was navigating, got ready to go back. I said, well, boom, boom, figured we all go this way. I got down, right down on the water, wingman on the side of me. I hit the beach at Miami, dead on. And the two wingmen got up. I, I just went over the top of the houses. <laughs> they got their numbers and turned to me. <laughs> oh. They didn't get mine. Because the airfield at that time wasn't about a few miles from Miami, center of Miami. But it, it was fun. And we would drop little bombs actually made by a foundry I represented later on in uh, Chattanooga. They were about a foot long, had fins on them, like a regular bomb, had a shotgun shell in the nose of it. So when you dropped it, when it hit, it would go off and send up smoke. So it would show where you hit. And uh, we were, we were, oh, we were in Miami. We tried to find it in the squadron. And it was foggy and low clouds and everything. Kept circling round and round until they finally found a hole in the clouds and we started making runs. He dropped a flare with something in the water so we could hit it. Well, we came in and made Seemed like I had eight of them. So I made, I got eight hits. Plus we had, for lunch, I'd gotten Cokes for all of us. I handed the two bottles back to my radio man. And when I'd tell him to drop it, he would drop it. We got two hits with Coke bottles. <laughs> that Sounds was, like you had a good time <laughs> down in Miami. It was just kid stuff. But it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. Uh, now, oh, it's something in Miami. We did field carrier landings there, where they take a carrier, I mean, they take a, a runway and mark an area on it like a carrier. 
and then you've got your landing signal officer there, and he brings you in. And you land, and this one had a hook on it, uh, cable. It was at Fort Lauderdale, actually. And the rule is, until you get a wave off, you're in control. You take it any way you want to. As soon as you get a wave off, you don't have any choice. You take it. You have to. Well, the landing signal officer brought me in too slow. When he did, all of a sudden, a wing goes down. I started into a spin. I slammed the throttle on, picked my wing up, cut it back off again, and hit the ground, caught the hook, <laughs> and did all right. And when I got back to the field later on, he came and apologized to me. <laughs> I told him, okay, he owed me one. <laughs> and later on, he was on a carrier uh, range at one time that brought me in. But anyway, uh, we had fun there on the fields. The fellow I told you could fly better, he could just hang a plane in the air. He'd come in a carrier just perfect. He was Cody. And then Hank Lovett was the other one from Columbia, South Carolina. And he was he was good. When you were doing what you were doing in Miami, were you keeping up with what was going on in the war in the different areas? Yes, but not that much. We didn't have a lot of free time. We had some, but you were primarily busy most of the day. And I don't ever remember having a radio. I'm sure they did. In fact, later on when they dropped the bomb uh, and we heard about it, I heard about it later. I did, never heard anything then. But that's, that's later on. Okay, we're still in Miami. Uh, I wore my whites on January the 1st, just so I could say I had worn whites on January the 1st. It wasn't cold, but it was still chilly. We left there and went to Chicago, and it was four or five below zero when we got there. And we got a ride some way into the middle of Miami. And we were stationed at Glenview, which was the NAS. They're right north of Chicago. And it was snow all over the place. Very few cars because of the problem then with gasoline. But we started making the rounds of all the bars. And finally found a taxi. And in Chicago, he would tell you where he's going, not where you were going. <laughs> so we talked him into taking us to the base. We had to pay him some money to do it. But we got to the base. And it snowed for about a week there. And uh, snow plows out there running the runway all continuously. And snow and filling in behind them. And there was poor one service, my Navy guy, that was cleaning the walkway from the flight center where we were up to the chow hall. And he never got over, I guess, 10 feet. It was closing in behind him as he, all day long, he was shoving snow. <laughs> but uh, we were there finally. It cleared enough for us to go. So they gave us back SNJs, which I told you was a good plane. But we got 12 of us in an echelon, which is stacked up at a 45 degree angle. And we were like a whip. And I was at the tail end of it. And you'd pull back and of course the nose would go up. We were used to flying torpedo, I mean the, you know, the torpedo plane, which is like a big truck. All of a sudden now we're in a sports car. And it was terrible. So I finally ended up putting my finger on top of the stick and flying it with my finger to keep from over. But we ended up 
flew all around the area so we'd know where it was. Then it got cleared enough. They had a excursion boat. They had put a flat top on. They had been trying to run training out of Jacksonville, but the German subs were too bad. So this took this in Chicago, and we broke ice for four miles out in the lake to get out where the ship could run. And of course it was cold, way below zero. And we did our first time we'd been flying on a carrier. So you were now on a carrier? Now on a carrier. It was a homemade carrier, but it was a carrier. It was a flat top. Now, was this a, a permanent assignment or was you, were you still training? It's all training, okay. everything in training. Okay. And uh, I came in to land and the deck was the guy ahead of him had crashed. So they brought me in and then gave me a wave off. And I t opened the throttle. When I did, whew, nothing happened. The engine just stopped. And so I flipped over. And somewhere in one of the engine classes I had said, they said, sometime when you throw the throttle on, you flood the engine. So what you have to do is chop the throttle off. And you have two fuel pumps that you cut on the second one. So in case your regular one goes off, you've got one when you land a takeoff. So I chopped off the other fuel pump, cut them back on, and caught up just before I hit the water. <laughs> now, of course, the ship's chewing me out all this time, screaming me to pull up, pull up. I was doing my best, but lucky I got out. One of my buddies did, and he went in, and uh, his safety harness, seat strap, broke, and he hit the cowling across here and put a good scar down across his face. But he said that he hit the water, and he got out, pulled out his uh, life preserve, I mean, f raft, life raft, and they always have a boat alongside any carrier ship to pick up anybody that goes in. So they pulled up alongside of him. He got in the water, swam over to it, and he said it was just a few feet. And it was so cold, he could not even climb the ladder. He was so exhausted from that. So they picked and pulled him up. But he was all right, and he did fine. He was a nice looking guy before, but after that he just a little scarred up. Yeah. But uh, we had fun there and landed. Coming back in was something. It was superstructures they built out, scaffolding and all that held up the deck. And I got back and forward, all wrapped up, everything I could get on, and standing in this structure, watching the ice crack as the bow started out breaking the ice yeah. out and through. It was beautiful. Wow. Of course, it was the middle of the night time we got back in, so it was dark. And I looked up in the skyline of Chicago. Only thing I could see was shinless <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> but it was something. I sat there until I almost froze to death. Just what I knew I'd never say yeah. that again. But it was it was interesting. That was a special memory seeing that. Right? Yes. So we, we qualified there and uh, we got orders to San Diego to ship. And uh, we were given proceed orders. Well, in the Navy, proceed orders means you have four days to make up your mind. Then you have travel time. And with three days travel from Chicago to San Diego. And then, yeah. Now, when you say make up your mind. What? You didn't have any choice, yeah, but okay. <laughs> theoretically. That's what I figured. Yeah. And uh, so they gave us seven days. Well, three of us decided, let's gamble. If we don't make it on time, what can they do? Send us to combat, we're going there anyway. <laughs> if, they, if they break us from being an officer, then we don't, can't fly because only officers can fly. So it was a no. <laughs> what, you know, I did not ask you this. What was your rank at this time? Engine. Okay. When I got commissioned, I was commissioned an engine. Okay. And so, we talked the 
servicemen there in Chicago into giving us our orders about six o'clock. They didn't take effect till midnight. We got us a plane to Atlanta. I was home at midnight. We stayed at Atlanta for six days. One was from Columbia and one was from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. We came back. The plane we had left Atlanta on was the first plane out of Atlanta in three days. So at that time, any sort of bad weather, rains, grounded all planes. So we were sweating out. We got on the plane. And of course, we had the, a priority, but the poorest priority you can get. We were going to combat, so that was it. So we uh, got we got to an hour late leaving Atlanta, got to Dallas, and missed a flight there. So we were in trouble. I went and laid down, got sleep, and one of my buddies sweet talked one of the flight people, girl into finding us a seat on a plane that was going to San Diego. And we made it to San Diego four hours before our time was up. You were living a charmed life. <laughs> Absolutely. And San Diego was where all of the admirals and everyone was. Now, an ensign is the lowest thing you can get. So we were, you stay away from the big boys. It was it was interesting. It's fun flying there. I never realized they have big guns protecting uh, San Diego the airfield. And when you fly over, you can see them down. And we just flew a little bit there, not much. And they were losing a lot of planes torpedo planes in Pacific. So they pulled a bunch of us out, and put us into VT-98, so that as soon as they lost three planes, or three pilots, three of us would go out and join them, wherever they happened to be. And so they sent us to airfield at Ventura, California to wait. And with my good luck, they stopped losing any planes. So we sat there, and that's where I was thumbing from Ventura, from Oxnard, where it was, to Ventura, California, when a girl picked me up driving a truck, and I married her three months later. Wow, what a great story. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was, and what I didn't know, she was, her her boss was ahead of her, and he picked up two of my buddies and he signaled her to pick me up. And so she outran him back to Ventura and we were sitting having coffee when they came in. And they asked us what we'll be doing that night, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> they said, do you want to go to L.A.? Yes. So he asked her and she says yes. Uh, and so three of us and Norma and the, the fellow and his wife all went to uh, L.A., went to uh, Juke Joint, uh, Burles. It was, it was a lot of fun. I bet it was. And we came back, and I saw her on the base. She delivered laundry for the base and for Fort Miami, too. And I asked her for a date, of course. And she said, find that Friday night, or Saturday, I forgot which. Anyway, we went with her boss and his wife again. Went to LA, had a big time. Slapsy Maxes that time. Anyway, came down to pick up the check. Uh, I picked up half of it, and he picked up half of it. She couldn't say a word. Months after we were married, she had bet him that she'd get a date with one of the three of us. And if she did, he had to pick up the tab. <laughs> so she, she couldn't say anything, and he didn't say anything. So I paid for a half of them. Anyway, uh, we were there 
I don't know, a couple of months. Then we were sent to, I guess Thermo was next in the desert. And the, the, the Thermo, they sent pilots that instructors that were doing everything wrong. It was the last place you wanted to be sent. It was hot, miserable, and old timers, regular Navy, everything strictly by the book. It was hot. So the first day we showed up with shirts, pants, but no hat and no tie and nobody fussed at us. Mm -hmm. So from then on we wore tennis shoes with no laces, no socks, shirts and t-shirts, I mean, pants and t-shirts, and nobody bothered us. <laughs> but we flew there, it was hot, and we had a lot of fun learning. And I guess that's when I got my crewman, a kid named Holiday and a kid named Lance. That was my gunner and my radio operator. And we would, we flew there. Oh, that's when I got my second airplane. I came in one time. See, when you're flying and a wing goes down, it means that you're drifting to your left. So you hit your right rudder and straighten it back up. If you're on the ground and the wing goes down, it means your centrifugal force is throwing you to your right. So you hit your left. And all you gotta do is look at the horizon, you know which way your nose is. I didn't. Wing went down. I thought I was still flying. My landing was so perfect. I was on the ground, didn't know it. And I hit that rudder when I did. I wound up and the wing on a TBM is like 10 feet in the air. I still drug it, tore it up on the ground. <laughs> and they made me go back and do all the paperwork of ordering a new wing. And I found out that the wing is one of the first ones made that I tore up. <laughs> but anyway, got through that. Was this your last assignment before going to the no, ship? No. Uh, we then finished there and went to Los Alamitos. And we did more field carrier landings. We also did night field carrier landings there. And as I said, the first night, you're lucky if you find the, air, the runway because nobody likes flying that close to the ground because the whole time when you first start flying, you're very careful where you fly, what you run into. And here we're taught, can't see anything, you got to fly at night. So we learned how to fly on field carriers where they'd bring us in, we land on the runway. But there wasn't any hook or anything. We just land and then take off, come back, make another run. And we did that. Uh, yeah, I missed one plane. When I was flying the SNJs, I did the same thing with it that I did with the TBM. I drug it and tore it up, so it was my third plane. Well, when we left Los Alamitos, we ordered to go to San Diego and get on the U.S. Ranger, which is a carrier, one of the first carriers of the U.S. And I was in charge of loading all of our planes on the carrier. And one of them, the, the bracket on the plane broke, and so the hook fell and messed up the plane. I'm in charge, so I get charged with one plane. <laughs> so that's my fourth plane. See, one more and I'd have been a Japanese ace. <laughs> but anyway, we flew out that and we flew uh, carrier landings out of the Pacific. Uh, I didn't know it until I checked my logbook. There were seven of them. And then about three weeks later, we flew out and landed on the Ranger out in the water from Los Alamitos. And we had night carrier landings. Well, 
came time for me to have to fly during the daytime before you fly at night, just to make certain you're know, all right. So they got the weather report, and the weather report was bad. It's going to rain tonight. So they stopped flying. Some of us didn't get a chance to fly. Well, it turned out it was beautiful, moonlit and everything. So they all qualified. And the ones I was that did the next day, the fellas flew back home and we were still sitting there. Uh, we do our qualifica qualifications, two day landings and then two night landings. And when was this? I know it's 1945, uh, but around what? April 45. Okay. And then that night, after we finished the next day, they put us on planes to fly back. I guess the others flew back with us that time. But uh, the plane I was on, another plane taxied into it, it tore up our wing, and another plane would work. So there was two planes there that didn't take off. So we were stuck. And that night, we worked with mechanics getting me fix those two planes so we could take off. Finally, the next day, they uh, got them fixed so we could take off. We talked the skipper into turning into the wind so we could take off, which he didn't want to do, but he did. And we took off and landed in, back in Los Alamitos. And I'm assigned for a flight. Well, I'd already talked with the skipper and he had given me a three-day pass to get married. So I got a flight I got on. He ain't find him. So go ahead and do the flight. By the time I get back, they found him. He's cleared me. And so Norma and a friend, Connie, and one of my buddies was Festerly, which ended up marrying Connie later on. But anyway. Uh, she and Connie were there at a motel in Fullerton, California. So the day that I was there is the thirtieth, which of course is holiday, which of course the courthouse is closed, which of course no marriage license. So we wait until the next day to get a marriage license. And then uh, Norma was, uh, had been a Mormon, but she had left the church when she was a teenager. And I was raised in the Methodist church. And so she said, I, I said, I said, I won't be married in a church because I, one of my buddies was married in JP and I didn't like that. So she said she didn't want to be married in the Mormon church she said, she asked somebody at the hotel, they said it was the Baptist church up the street. So we got married at the Baptist church. And uh, they had something going on there. We got there late, she was dragging her feet. She couldn't make up her mind, but she wanted to get married. She told me later. But anyway, we got there and there's nobody there but the organist and the preacher and his wife. And they said, do we mind if the organist played? And she played background the whole time of the service. It was beautiful. And nobody in the church, when he finally said, you may kiss the bride. And I went to kiss her and I said, I'm hungry, let's eat. <laughs> and we, we turn around and the room is full of people. They've all came in and were quiet enough that we never even heard them. Oh. But it was real sweet. It was a nice wedding. And it was really nice. And I had, I think, two days before I had to get back to the job. That was really a special wedding, wasn't it? Yeah, it was nice. And then we got orders. We still didn't need any more of these torpedo planes and pilots. Now, what was going on in the war at the time? They were, it was the Quartz Pacific, Iwo Jima had been gone, and several others. 
I'm, not, I'm trying to look back at it. We were assigned to uh, VC-85, which had been shot up real badly. They lost about half their men. And so we were assigned to make it up. And they sent us to Quileute, Washington, uh, which is up on the tip of Washington State, to f finish training with them. And we were there two or three months, maybe. And uh, we were finished. We were waiting for orders each day. And then we heard they dropped the bomb. And then boom, for you can turn around good. We, they closed the base, which made it nice. Whenever they open a base, all of the officers have to ante up money to pay for the club, the whiskey and everything. And yet when they close it up, you get all of it free. Wow. So we had free whiskey to the last. What a deal. We even got it and gave it to our crewmen, <laughs> which is against the rules too. <laughs> and I was stationed, ordered to go to NAS Seattle as, co as a test pilot, which sounded like a lot of fun. The day that I checked in, we were living in a motel that day, uh, they dropped the points to 36, and that day I got my 36th point. Boy. So, I, when I soon I found out about it, it was noon by then, I got to the separation center. They wouldn't know where you been. They were looking for me. <laughs> but anyway, I got through there, and the nice thing about it, when they, I'd had to leave as an officer after Pensacola for a couple of weeks. And I think that was all the leave I had. Well, they counted the whole time I was in the Navy, then gave me about two and a half days per month or something like that for every month I was in the Navy. And the only time they charged me was that two weeks I took. All the time I got off, there were three different times I got off as a cadet, went home. So I got, also they paid me transportation from Seattle to my home in Atlanta, which was nice. And I had bought an old 36 Ford at that time. And so Norma, and she had a daughter when I married her. And she was very much pregnant with Connie. And we drove to her home in Ventura. And I went home for about three weeks. She didn't feel like she could make the trip. And then I came back and I stayed there for a year. And Dad and Mom came visit us, because we had Connie by then, so they could see the granddaughters. And he told me if I'd come back to Georgia, he would provide me a place to live. And the GI Bill paid for my schooling. So fine. So we left California and came to Atlanta. And that was the day of the wine car fire, fire where everything happened. There may be people watching this that don't know about the wine car fire. Talk just briefly about what There was, was a terrible fire in Atlanta, right in the middle of town, next door to Davison's, which is now Macy's. And there was a bunch of girls there, I'm not sure, some outfit or something and like 20 or so of them were killed. And one of my good friends later on lived with us, was in charge of photography for United Press. And he was taking a lot of the pictures, one of this girl falling down that you see, yeah. and then he's the one that took that picture. Yeah. And he had nightmares from then on because of it. But it was terrible. And there was no way to anybody to get out. There was, they didn't have any of the safety precautions they have now. So anyway, we came to Atlanta. I went back to Emory. And Dean Miller was the Dean of Admissions. And I walked in to visit to see him and see if I could get back in. He called me by name 
because he had been one of my customers at the grocery store that I'd worked at. <laughs> and so, of course, I got back in, and then the, the tuition had gone terrible. It was then $125 a quarter, and Uncle Sam paid that. And my books at one time, one was $35, because I was taking English and had two books. And they had to pay for that. But otherwise, and it was a different world then. When I went in the service, you could have used a $10 bill as a bookmark in your book and laid it on the library steps, and it would still been there when you got back. When I got back, and nobody, I mean, in the middle of the exam, I need a beer, anybody want to go? Half the class, get up and go get a beer and come back. Nobody thought about cheating, it just wasn't done. And later on, cheated where they could. Really? Yeah. In that short a period of time, it changed, huh? Yeah, because it was, I guess, servicemen, and nobody cared about grades when I was there. You had to get a B average to get into a fraternity. So I made my B average in the first quarter and got into the Paquets uh, the second quarter. And then, of course, I went in the Navy and never did come back. They got credit for my great good grades, but that's one thing I did for them. But, uh, Talk a little bit about your life since you, well, got out of the Navy, but also once you got out of Emory, you went to law school today. Okay. You? Now, before I finished my second year of law school, Everybody got the bright idea to, to learn how to take a bar exam. They started taking the exam when they first went into law school. So Emory, you know, only 10% of Emory students pass the bar, you know. So Emory said, if you take the bar without permission, you cannot get your degree until you pass the bar. So, uh, we didn't care. I didn't plan to practice law. I just, I wanted to go back to California and work for Safeway because I grew up in the grocery store. There was a meat cutter as well as grocery and knew all of it. My dad was of uh, Kroger, he ended up being vice president, but uh, they were very strict on family, so I couldn't work for Kroger. So I was gonna work for Safeway in California. And then when I was out there that year, I worked in Safe Wind Store. And this time I took the bar just to take it, and I did it before I finished my second year in law school. And luck is having, I passed it. <laughs> so, no problems. And then uh, I had already started working in a law office in July. This was December, 1st of December, took the bar. And during that fall, I worked in this law office doing investigations. He did primarily nothing but workers' compensation and represented a lot of insurance companies. And I just took over his practice, really, and would help him. And then when I got admitted to the bar, uh, he had a heart attack about the same, I don't know, two weeks before I went into the bar, and they had held his cases until I got admitted to the bar. And uh, I then tried the cases, and at that time I was making $25 a week, big money. And did you continue to practice law for a I, while? I, I didn't, yeah. Uh, by the time I finished law school, I'd already tried five cases in the Court of Appeals. And I won one of them. Others I won, but they just hadn't come out yet. Uh, 
and I was, he did workers' comp, so I got into workers' comp because I knew that Kroger would have it, and so I needed that experience. Well, I read every case that had been decided since the law was passed in 1921, and I became a so-called expert on workers' comp because nobody knew it. They didn't teach it in law schools at all, and nobody knew it. And again, I was good in studying. And I sat down, I read every case. I indexed them on three by five cards with a descriptive word index, something word that would give me a hint. And I did that, and I became known by the judges as someone that really knew comp, and the appellate judges, the office, the clerk's office, right at the end of the Capitol, second floor of the Capitol, right at the end of it, all the judges' offices all went down there. I couldn't get to the judges, to the clerk's office to file a paper. Come here, sit down. I got this case, and they would tell me the case. What should I do? And it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. And the, the fact that they trusted me because I knew how they were going to rule ahead of time. And I would never tell anybody because I knew all the attorneys in it. And everybody knew it. <coughs> uh, but nobody asked me. So I guess they, they trusted me too. Well, that's, a, that's a credit to you. It was. It was, it was nice, but it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. And and you stayed in Atlanta the rest of your career? Stayed, right? Yes. Talk about uh, your family a little bit. Okay. Because uh, I had Connie when we came back to Atlanta, and then Johnny Mack was born in 1950, 10 or 11 days before I graduated from law school. And uh, I represented any number of companies, but also represented self insureds And I actually made a good bit of my reputation and money in self insureds uh, Whatever the normal premium would be for a company, I charged them 6% of that to do all of the clay work, all the investigation, all of the filing of all the forms, and through one trial, if it was contested, and I had it. And that was, I got so that I was making over 100,000 a year back then, gross, from represented companies. I represent all sorts of textile companies uh, do you remember s and Green Stamps? Okay. They were a good cash company because they got the cash before they ever had to pay out anything. They used that cash to buy up all sorts of textile plants, two glass plants, lots of things. And so I took over that. And so I was handling cases from also Southern Airways represented them from Virginia to Louisiana, from Kentucky to the Cayman Islands. Uh, Florida, I always kept a member of my firm that had a, that had a Florida law license that carried me there in Mississippi and Alabama. I was Never did anything. Nobody ever challenged me. South Carolina and North Carolina were real strict. So I took the justice license and became a licensed adjuster in those two states. And the lady that was head of the workers' comp in Tennessee was a wonderful lady. I went by to see her and I told her what I was doing, was handling all the cases. She told me how to stay out of trouble with her. And how to do everything right, and it helped me greatly. Uh, 
And so my, my records with the state of Tennessee was very good. <laughs> I knew what I had to do before they called me. Helps to have the right contacts, doesn't it? Yes, it was nice. I represented St. Regis Paper Company in Mississippi and Florida. And uh, it was a wonderful company to represent. Uh, pulp waters are breeding to themselves. They're different from anybody. And whether the accident was compensable or not, if the pulp was thought it ought to be paid, I paid it. Made no difference whether it was legal or not, because if I didn't, they'd have burned the woods. <laughs> and they would have thought I was trying to pull something. Yeah. But they were good people. Yeah. And over towards Pensacola in that area, a bunch of Cajuns, and they were also a breeding to themselves too, wonderful people. But it was nice to have them. And St. Regis had two pipe companies that made uh, drainage pipes, big stuff, culverts. And that was fun because I would like my fly to Tampa, work my way to Orlando, and then down my dad was. Spending, he was retired by then in Frostproof, Florida. So I would drive down and go fishing with him and then fly back. Mm -hmm. So I did business and pleasure that time, but it was good. Uh, as my life as attorney, I became known by the Workers' Comp Board and others. And I'd always be talking to whenever they had a, any sort of a seminar or anything. It's because in the bar you have to get so many hours of training each year. But when you teach, you get twice the hours for teaching. So I always, and it carried over, so I always had lots of hits ahead of me. But I always still went to the bars anyway. And it was, it was fun. How long did you practice law? How many years approximately? Uh, I closed my last case out last year, but I had already referred it to another attorney. I just stayed in on it. What was crazy, the fee I got out of it put me in another bracket, and the increase in my taxes was exactly the same amount as my fee. <laughs> That's the way it works. So out of my last case, <laughs> I netted nothing. <laughs> Good time to retire, right? Yeah. A friend of mine told me that when it's not fun anymore, stop doing yeah, it. that's good advice. And right now, I still do pro bono work mm -hmm. for anyone in the church, yeah. friends, uh, for estates, wills, good. Uh, deeds, anything of that nature. You get a lot of satisfaction out of that because you're helping people. Yes, it is. It's a lot of fun, and I had one, just finished it up. Husband died, and it had no will, and the home was in both their names. So but she can't sell it until she gets it put in her name. So we had to pay to get her part of the administrator of the estate so she could deed half of the property to her, but she's lucky. She put it up for sale and sold it within a week. Wow. So she did fine. She was a very interesting person. She came back here to be with her daughter and her daughter's family, which is a real nice family. Yeah. I want to be sure we get the names of the law firms you worked with so your okay. kids and everybody. We started out. Uh, Latimer, and Savelle. This was Pete Latimer. He was head of the Board of Education for the city of Atlanta, also attorney for them, as you might guess. I rented space for them. When my boss died, I see, I was admitted to the bar in 1950. 1954, 
Christmas Eve, he died of a heart attack. And two of his main clients called me and wanted me to take over their work. One was Hartford. It was a good company, real good company, still is. And uh, I started practicing, but the trust company, we were in the trust company building, and they needed space. They had tried to kick the boss out, but he was too strong politically for them to ever do it. So the week after he died, I'm in the office, and the man comes in. He says, you know why I'm here? I said, yep. He says, can you let me, now this is January, can you let me know by June what your plans are? Gave you a little time. I said, that is the easiest way of getting evicted, I know. <laughs> well, it turned out that Pete Latimer uh, knew my boss's wife, and she asked him to bid it on the property. I had made an offer to her for the office. It wasn't that much because he didn't have that much. And he checked and told her he couldn't match me at all. So, but he told me that he was forming a law firm with Frank Carter and that they were going to be in the Grant building and they had an office, extra office they could rent out. I said, good. So I got me an office and that was Carter Latterman Savelle then. And Frank Carter represented Skoko, some of the big companies. Uh, he was oh, head of the Lawyers Club, you name it. Everything you can think of. He was a nice man. And after wasn't very many years at all, he died. And he had a brother. Frank Carter, who was in the office of an associate of Frank's. Well, he didn't want anything. He was like he was going out of the law or something. So Pete found Bruce Woodruff and got into a law firm with him and made it Woodruff, Latimer, Savelle. And I ran in space from them. Well, Pete Latimer got the bright idea that he could do better by himself than he could be in the law firm. So he served notice on the law firm that he was withdrawing. So one of the associates was Ed Lane. And so Bruce Woodruff and Ed Savelle got Ed Lane and I together and wanted to know if we wanted to form a law firm. Of course we did. So. Uh, the name of it, of course, Woodruff Latimer, and then we flipped a coin and they had run, so it became Lane and Williams. So it made it best because everybody can remember the last name, but they don't remember the third name. So anyway, we had that law firm, and that stayed there until Ed Lane did some things. Let's say he was a ladies man that Ed Savelle didn't like. And you gotta remember back then, attorney that was divorced was outlawed. I mean, you had certain things that the attorney just didn't do. And so he didn't want Ed edit. And about that time Bruce Wood just died of a heart attack. And Bruce did all the documentation for all of your financing of banks and everything, like Ford Motor Company. Whenever a car hit the end of the assembly line, it automatically was owned by the finance company. And they handed it through the dealer and on until you bought it. And they'd probably finance it for you too. But he did all the paperwork on that back in the 30s. So he was the expert on financing. And he had a lot of good clients that he did work for. So 
he passed on and Savelle didn't want to be in law firm with Ed Lane anymore. So I told him, Ed and I had two great egos. We could not be partners together, we'd fight each other. We had two associates. One was Lawson Cox and the other was Henry Angel. So I said, okay, let's bring them in as partners. So we formed the firm Savelle Williams, Cox and Angel. And that worked for quite a while. Henry Angel's dad was an expert on financing mergers and so forth in West Virginia. Uh, and McCormick Tea Company, Spices and all, wanted to buy Handy Pack, which was a company here. And Henry drew up all the papers using his dad's forms and sent it, and they assigned it to about 10 different attorneys, just divided it up into tents, gave each one. They accepted everything he wrote. <laughs> so it was nice, it was, Henry was good. But it got so, Henry and the others got lazy. So we had two young associates, Mike Jablonski and Mark Gannon, two brilliant young men that were very good. And we met Ed and I with the two of them and we formed a law firm and gave the others a right to stay with us as associates on salaries or percentage if they wanted it because they weren't supporting themselves. And Henry left, Lawson left, some of the others stayed. And then we kept that law firm and it's still there now, Savannah Williams. You gotta be proud of that. Yes, very much so. Uh, good reputation. They still, Mark Gannon, made certain it's a good reputation. We had hired uh, Joe Horsey, MBA, who was a geologist and ran a crew in the uranium mine in hmm. uh, Arizona. And she had run a law office. And I told her, and what we would do is, how do we steal from the firm? We'd sit down and figure out how we could steal. Then we'd put in ways so that nobody could do it. Yeah. So we would keep doing this. We had a lot of fun. She still runs it. She only works a couple of days a week now, but she still runs a law firm. And Talk briefly about where you live now and this beautiful land you've okay. got and your family being All close right. by. Now, we lived at, I built a lake house, started in 19... 54, 5, something. No longer. When was Robbie born? 65. So 1965. I started on it. And it took five years before I got it dried in. I'd work about 30 Saturdays a year on it. And we moved out there and lived there a year, but the wife didn't like it. It was too lonely during the week. And my dad had bought the farm of Square Mile in 1949 for my brother-in-law to run. And I don't know, probably in 75, 76, dad gave 10 acres to each one of us, my three sisters and I. And Mom told me to take this corner. She said, it's the prettiest corner on the, lot, on the farm. So I took it, but I didn't file the deed. A couple of years later, Dad's fussing at me because he's still paying taxes on it. So I went ahead and filed the deed and became the legal owner of this property, 
which is 10 acres. And then when Norma didn't want to stay at the lake house anymore, we decided to build here. So we designed the house. And looking back at it, I don't know how we designed it. I don't remember making any decisions on it. The one decision we did, gonna have a hall from the back door all the way through to the bathroom. And her brother says, no, you're wasting a lot of space. So we took out the wall across the great room. So that was the only change there. But Norma pretty well did it. I did all of the electrical work except the entrance cables. I did all of the plumbing except the basic plumbing when they put the concrete. And I hired a man by the name of Williams and no relation. There was a contractor. I said, okay, if I don't like what you do, I'm not gonna pay you. He said, if you don't pay me, I'll quit. We shook hands, and that's why we did it. <laughs> Just like they used to do it, right? Right. There was nothing signed, there was nothing. <laughs> and it was nice, he did a good job. We designed it. The windows behind you are sliding glass doors, the same thing on my study across the patio, so that you, when you entertain, you can rotate all the way through. And we've had, we've had people sitting out in card tables out in the patio or in the great room. Before we had three tables in here, we used just one. But now we can have about 29 in here, I think. And then the kitchen table. And the kids know they can't eat in the great room. So. Well, you did a great job because it's a beautiful place. It is. We, we really enjoy it. Norman did a good job. Speaking of kids, I want to, you've talked about it periodically, but how many okay, children, let's start. Many children? Okay, now, Connie, my oldest daughter, Sherry, had two children, Kathy and Mike. Kathy has five children. Mike has four. Connie has six children. Uh, her oldest has four plus three stepchildren. His daughter, Carrie, is up on the hill. She has four children. One is married and has two children. The next one is Blair, who lives this side of her. He has six children. And then Marty, who lives right across the road, has three children, one married, and has a little girl, Ava. And I forgot you, uh, Blair's oldest son uh, is married. His oldest daughter is married and has a child. And then Jenny, who lives behind you in this house there, she has six children. One is married and lives in the basement. And then my son, I had two children. He's a junior. His son is the third. His son is the fourth. It's Jack. I'm called Papa or, J or John. My son is Johnny Mike. His son is Little Mike. And his son is Jack. And he has two daughters, which are lovely girls. He served a mission in the uh, Mormon Church, as did Marty and Blair. And he served it in Costa Rica, because he had Spanish. And when he came back, he went to, well, Tech, but he also ended up in BYU and got his degree in uh, Spanish and his master's in Spanish. Then he taught at Tulane and got his PhD in Spanish, Tulane. He's now teaching in Coca College, which is a Baptist college in Hartsville, South Carolina, which is out of Florence. And, yeah. He forgot two of them. What's Jared, that? Jared and Susanna. Jared, Jared and Susanna. Forgot oh. two of your <laughs> I'm amazed that you can remember all those. I, I can never remember uh, that many names. I guess. Well, Kathy. 
so that's five children. Yeah. Uh, Kathy is a nurse. She now has a degree, but she's working on his master's. Mm -hmm. But she's also an expert on hospital administration. Mm -hmm. She was a good nurse. She's always put her in charge of the floor and everything, which I think is stupid. You take good nurses and you put them in administration. Well, she's now in administration, doing very well. She works for a company that hospitals hire. They send her there for six months to take over the hospital and to solve all their problems. And she's done this a number of times. Uh, one was uh, Cartersville, Georgia, and then uh, down in Texas. Then she went to Honolulu, and I got to go over and visit her in Honolulu. Oh. Part of her benefits consisted of an apartment that rents for 3000 a month on the 43rd floor looking down on Waikiki. Good grief. And of course, that's where I stayed. And while she's working, they have a nice deal there in Honolulu. If you're over 65, all of public transportation is a dollar and you get a transfer. So each morning I would walk to a shopping center where the bus stopped and ride all the way to the other end of the island where the bus stopped, get off, transfer to another bus, come all the way back. So I had five hours of travel for a dollar. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. It was a real good deal. And then on the weekends we would travel and do all the tourist stuff, which was nice, a lot of fun. And every Friday night, the hotel they put on all the fireworks and everything, which were right outside our window, we just watched them outside. And looking down on the beach there and the surface, it was real interesting. And she's right now in Wisconsin, running a hospital up there. And I keep saying I'm gonna get up there, but I haven't yet. But she's also been back to Texas, running one in Houston for six months. And she's just very good at it. And she has three children by her first husband, and two of them are married. One has two children, the other one has two children. And they're lovely. And then she's married again and has two boys, and they're quite the athletes. He's football in high school, doing real well. And he'll get all sorts of scholarships when the time comes. He's just good. You're leaving quite a legacy with that family. Yes, I didn't get through the whole thing now. Uh, we have 10 grandchildren. And just for information, half of those grandchildren are grandparents. Now I have 46 great-grandchildren and 10 great-great-grandchildren. Do you ever have a family reunion? <laughs> well, we meet about twice a year and there's usually up to about 80 of us. There's actually 85 counting all in-laws in it. But we'll have my birthday in July, when I was 95, uh, they had 80 here, and 10 were non-members of the family. <laughs> there was the one from the law firm and friends. Dad, you didn't tell them about your two youngest grandchildren and what they're doing. Just Jared and Susanna. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, Jared is kind of his youngest boy. He is an attorney here in Atlanta, in Newton doing real well. He is married. His wife works in a optometrist's office and they have two children, two little girls, which are wonderful. They drive him nuts, which is what his, he did to his mother. <laughs> he and I have been fighting since he was in the high chair. <laughs> and uh, he's doing real well though. And uh, Susanna, which I didn't tell you about, Susanna is my son's daughter. 
Uh, uh, she married a boy, a Jewish boy. She was a, a Mormon. She left the church. And neither one of them active now. But she worked in uh, California, below Monterey. Big Sur. Big Sur. Couldn't think of it. And uh, met him there. And they ended up getting married. And then she moved to uh, St. Louis at Washington University. She'd already gotten her master's at uh, Brigham Young. No, she got a, she got a master's at, Georgia, at the University of Georgia. Then she got her PhD from Washington University. And she was, was teaching there while she was doing that. She and her husband loved Big Sur, but they can't make a living there to pay for the cost of living there. And they were trying to find a place. They took a visit to Seattle and fell in love with it. He is, uh, he's got his masters. He's a designer. All of the advertisements you see on TV, the videos, he creates those. Wow. So he can do that anywhere. Yeah. And uh, they decided they liked Seattle, so they moved out there and spent a year renting, and they now bought them a home. And they have two children and two cute kids. They're smart. Well, see, uh, Johnny Mac had an IQ of 142. His wife, Laura, was more than that. And little Mike, I'm sorry, was more than that. And Suzanne is smarter than all of them. Uh, just brilliant. And Talented family. Yeah. They, they really done it. Has he got them all now? Yes, all his grandchildren. <laughs> and they, they do everything from work. My son does the mapping for the Census Bureau. Huh. But each of his grandchildren chose a different direction, and they've all done well. Yeah. Yeah. All ten of them have done very well. Mm -hmm. I want to give everybody here a chance to ask anything that didn't get asked. But first, I'd like you to pick up your logbook and make sure we get that on camera. Yeah. And <laughs> anything you want to say about it? Or? Perfect. Just like that. I found it sometime a little while back. I got it out today just to check, see if I remember things. I didn't remember being on the Ranger twice. I knew I had qualified on a carrier in uh, out of San Diego, but I looked in here and see where I was logged in on the carrier yeah. and where I qualified for carrier landings, also qualified for night carrier landings. And uh, where also I checked in my 38 revolver got cleared because they wouldn't let me take it home. I did steal my machete. <laughs> they didn't keep that. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, hold that up. What a okay. Wow. Little high. There you go. Oh, yeah. yeah. As you can see, I've changed considerably. What a handsome You look mighty good to me. <laughs> but she is. A lovely girl. Uh, I found a talk that somebody gave at her funeral. I read it a while ago. See, she was never boring. She could pull jokes on anybody. Anything went. And one crazy thing she did, she would drive around the parking lot at Walmart or anywhere, 30 minutes finding a place close to the door. Well, she found one at the very edge of it, right outside the door. She parked there. She came out. Somebody had parked right up next to her, so she couldn't get in. So she had to get in the other side and come back. So what does she do? She opens her door and backs up 
and goes forward, and backs up, and goes forward, and then leaves the car. <laughs> <laughs> Often wondered what the person thought when they came back and looked at that car. Sounds like she had a good sense of humor. Oh, she did that. Uh, uh, you obviously were a loving couple and had a great marriage for a lot of years. I'll tell you, the last time I talked with her, we had a saying. I'd say, I love you. She'd say, I love you too. I'd say, I know, because I'm so pretty. <laughs> it's easy. And she'd say, yes, I know. The day before she died that evening, I went in there and she was awake. I said, I love you. And she said, I love you. We go through the whole thing. She says, yes, I know. She turned over. And she died that night. Never said another word. Wow. So the last word I got from her, so, you can't beat can't beat that. No, I mean, that's that's really special. It was, and good kids. My son drove everybody nuts. His teacher at uh, Woodward Academy, GMA back then. Mm -hmm. Anyway, said he was the smartest kid he'd ever seen in his class, mm -hmm. but he was also the laziest kid he had ever seen in his class. He couldn't do English every summer, except one when he went to Mexico. He would spend in summer school taking English over again because he would fail it. And finally, when he was a senior, he was failing English as usual. And the teacher said, write me a paper and get any help you can by anybody, and I'll count that as your final grade. So he had good friends. He played on the football team, too. So they had a party, swimming party, at the house, and all of his friends wrote the paper for him. <laughs> so he passed his English and he graduated. And when they called off the name, they say, please don't anybody clap or anything till we get through and you can do it. Well, one right before him was a class drunk, so we all clapped for him. But as soon as Johnny Mac's name was called, the whole crowd just broke up. Because <laughs> he was, he got good friends. He was lazy. He got into computers. Uh, the man that runs Sky Valley bought a computer back in the 70s. Johnny Mac was running our B business up there. And the two got together. And he was, both of them were learning how to run computers. Johnny Mac got into it. In fact, he ran a computer company for a while. And uh, he was always into things. He, he made a living, but he never really got, made any big money. And a lot of things went wrong for him. But last year or so of his life, he got into the backup business he had a high school kid that was a genius, is a genius, of writing programs. Johnny Mac got with him and they wrote a program for backing up things. And about that time, Congress passed a law that all doctors and hospitals have to back up everything. It has to be encrypted, has to be off some premises to protect privacy. And of course, their program did just that. And at uh, one of the conventions with all the computer people there, they won top prize for that program. Wow. And it turned out that uh, he died, to say bad cow disease, we call it. Anyway, uh, his wife, got very wealthy selling his shares of stock in the company he had very well. And he had given this kid a good 25% of the stock. And uh, so he's done very well. He's still running the company. Good. And it's just doing fine. Would any of y'all like to ask any questions or anything? That, yeah. I think I'm good. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you doing well, this. I mean, you, you, you're still living a really special, exciting life, and your, it looks like your whole life you've 
been in leadership positions and you've had respect. Uh, something I didn't tell you. In July of 1994, we had been going to different potluck dinners and such things at the Mormon Church because Connie was quite active. Mm -hmm. And we knew a lot of people there. Well, she got up and she said, I'm going to church, you want to go? And I said, certainly. So I got up and went to church, been going ever since. I joined the church in 94, December 4th. On December the 5th, I take a year, I sealed her in the temple, and uh, we served a mission running the bishop's storehouse, which is used to provide food for people that need it. And we ran that for about 18 months, and then we were called to a meeting, and I was told I had to go see the state president, who is head of like 12 churches, you might say. And I said, Norma, what have you done? Why does the state president want to see us? What have I done? She said, I haven't done anything. Well. We got there and he says, will you take any calling? And I said, yes, but I don't want to go to Siberia. <laughs> he said, no, they called me as a bishop. So I ran the Sharpsburg ward for about 18 months. And the first almost six months of it, I was still running the bishop's storehouse with Norma. And then, uh, Bishop is called, I think, because he's needed for that particular ward at that particular time. And I was called because of my age, I'm sure, and my background. And the ward did real well. It increased. Uh, in fact, we split twice during the 18 months I was there. And it, it was quite an experience. And the story goes, when I was set apart by the state president, he said I would know all of the members of the ward. That was about 300. And Norma said, when he got through, you're dreaming. He can't even remember anybody's name. One time I went to introduce her, I forgot her name. <laughs> <laughs> but within 30 days after I was called as bishop, I knew everyone in the ward. And then 30 days after I was released, I couldn't tell you anybody's name. <laughs> so, so you're called for a purpose, and I was called for a purpose, which was good. I enjoyed it. It was quite an experience. Got a lot of nice people, real nice people. I always said, if you judge a religion by its people, the Mormons got them all beat, because they produce some wonderful people. Well, you're obviously one of them. Well, not as good as some, but I try. You know, Dad, one more thing about your life is how, many, how often do you travel? Oh, well, see, when I practiced law, I tried cases all over the state of Georgia. Of the 159 counties, I tried cases in 154 of them. I would travel 40 plus thousand miles a year just driving around the state. I represent, I think, every coffee pot sawmill in Georgia and a lot of insurance companies. And I traveled that way, and then when I got to representing uh, s and St. Regis, those I started traveling from Kentucky. I said, I never got to the Cayman Islands. I tried to get them to give me a pass, and they wouldn't. <laughs> but I got to all the other places. And then since uh, I have retired. We've been going on, well, I guess, 10 different times on cruises. And I've driven all over the country with my grandson, the one named after me. I've been with him the last three summers. We've been two of them to uh, Newfoundland and Prince, uh, Prince Albert. 
Prince yeah, Edward. Prince Edward Island. And that is the most beautiful spot you'll ever want to go. Uh, I'm going to go back to that place. It is just nice. People are nice. Uh, my grandson rented a house there for about 10 days. We spent half of it going one way to the island, half going the other one. The year before, we had gone to Newfoundland and gone all the way out to the end of it where the Vikings landed. And they've done a good job of restoring the buildings and all. And it's interesting. And the cold weather there, the motel we stayed at was up on a hill. I mean, up on a hill. And he said that the winter before, snowed so much, the snow was over the motel all the way down across the road. Okay, of course. Wow. <laughs> and there you can buy, if you're a citizen, you can buy uh, firewood for $7 a cord, and you can get, it's $4 a cord, and you can get seven cords. $28, seven cords of wood. And they do it in the winter time where they can drag the trees out of the forest out onto the road with their snowmobiles and then cut it up. Most of the trees, like six inches in diameter, no big stuff. And then stack them all up and they put the tag on them that has their number. Sure. All alongside the road, you see these stacks of firewood all lined up with the tag across the top of them. Yeah. Then they use them in the winter time. And they need it, I guess, with it. Yes. And it's. It's nice. I've been, I've been to all 50 states. I said Canada, Mexico, been to Costa Rica four or five times. Been oh, I spent oh, 10 days in Honduras. The uh, boy whose grandfather created uh, Bluebird Body Company down in Fort Valley. Uh, his grandfather got interested in doing missionary work in Honduras of all places. And his son would go down there and work, Bert. And Bert invited my son and I, Marty, and I think Blair. No, it's Bla Mac. Oh, little Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, to go to Costa Rica, I mean to Honduras and work in the boys. There's 185, say, teenage boys. If you were 12 and in the sixth grade, they wouldn't touch you. If you were 17 in the sixth grade, they'd touch you. <laughs> These were throwaway kids. Hmm. And they all worked half a day and went to school half a day. And they all used machetes, all had their own, all had scars on the left arm when they hit it with the machete. And it was, it was interesting. And my grandson, the one that got into Spanish, uh, he was down there halfway learning Spanish while we were there in Honduras. So we had a lot of fun. And the uh, family that created came back from the Second World War and just felt the Lord wanted him there. And with nothing, he just went down there, had nobody to support him, nothing, and just took over and started doing things. And he created this thing, which is still there. And it's, it's quite a deal. And they had a, we were building a house for one of the missionaries that teaches, they have a school for the children of the people that work there. And they wanted a building a home for them. And they asked me, did I know anything about plumbing? And I said, yes. So they took me off of my tractor. I was hauling a water wagon and put me doing the plumbing. And it was different from any plumbing you've ever seen. They had built everything out of handmade concrete block. And whenever they needed a pipe down, they dropped the pipe down from the top of the concrete block down on the bottom of it. Then you'd have, where well, you have your commode, you'd have to knock a hole with a sledgehammer into the concrete block to reach in to find the pipe and then 
fitting to it, bring it out, put the fitting on, and then did all of that. <coughs> and get through, no water, you had to carry it. Uh, I put air, compressed, use a compressor and ran air throughout the system and build the pressure up and left it overnight, fine. All my lines are solid and come back and then I throw the switch in the shower that turns the hot and cold water to the other side, lost everything. And then I couldn't find anything. But there was no, either hot or cold water, I forgot which, nothing. So I got up on top of one of the drain pipes and with a ladder and with this boy that I got, handed me buckets, I was pouring water in it, filling, trying to fill up all the pipes. And my grandson came out and says, Papa, there's a leak here. There was a wet spot on the concrete block up on the wall. So I knocked a hole in it, found out that when they put the pipe down, it wasn't long enough, so they put another one on top of it. <laughs> there was no fitting to the hole. <laughs> so I fixed that. And then, same thing again. <laughs> there was two more just like that. <laughs> but we had to do it. So I finally got it, and then fixed it all up and got it to working. Well, after hearing what I heard today, I think you can do just about anything. <laughs> My dad taught me that you could do anything you wanted to. You can be anybody you want to be. Well, you obviously listened to your dad. I mean, you're a real inspiration to me, and I think everybody that hears your story because you, number one, you're still living life to the fullest, and you continue yeah, to live life to the and fullest. And how long will that be? Will it be tomorrow I get run over by a truck? Well, or will it be a. See, ten years, up to ten years from now, I could be a great, great, great grandfather. I'm convinced you will be. <laughs> That's not what I've seen today. Well, I really want to tell you how much we've, and number one, enjoyed this, but it's just been an honor to meet you and hear your story and all the successes you've had and the leadership role you've played throughout your life and the influence you've had on people and the good works you're continuing to do. And, and, of course, I want to thank you for your service in the Navy. Oh, see, that's the thing at that time during the war. There wasn't a question about what you would do, you knew you were going to. It just wasn't. And, see, the 30s were a bad time, late 30s. See, there was, you think about the Depression of 29 to 33. But there was one 37, 38 that was almost as bad till they started providing all of the lend lease to England and everybody. We started building war materials and that increased the economy and made it so that when we needed it, it was there, which we could be thankful for. Well, you know, that may be a good point to end this conversation. So. Thank you again so much. Sure thing. Thank you for coming. You're, you're an amazing man. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. <laughs>